I'm currently revisiting an Oregon Trail pioneer couple in my wife's tree to see if I can break through that brick wall. The pair were part of the first wagon train to Oregon, and their children preserved quite a few stories about the journey, but I know almost nothing about their parents. That's made me think about how to use this type of primary source document, including its biggest peril, the potential unreliability of the source. Perhaps their memory is faulty, or they embellished a story to make it more compelling. Or perhaps they deliberately hid some details that they found embarrassing. When I look at oral and written history, I try to break the information into two categories. First are genealogical data points such as birth and marriage years. I use these as a roadmap to find a primary source such as a parish register. I try not to take these at face value. Second are personal stories that probably can't be verified but can flesh out one of my ancestors' lives. As to reliability, I try to consider the human risk factors. The larger the gap between when the story was written down or told and when the events actually happen, or the more people retelling the story, the more skeptical I am. Yeah, this is all common sense, but I find it fairly easy to get distracted and forget them. Take two stories told by cousins about how their grandparents, my third great-grandparents, fled Ireland during the Great Hunger and arrived as refugees in the United States in 1849 or 1850. One cousin, Charles Klein, said simply that his maternal grandparents, Joseph Fitzgerald and Ellen Burke, both came to America and, after residing in Buffalo, New York for a short time, removed to Manitowoc, Wisconsin. The other cousin, my grandfather, wrote a full page about their flight from the Great Hunger, including a long, detailed tale from his grandfather involving a drunken ship captain, a three-month voyage, and an arrival in Boston where he had a cousin named Red Joe. My grandfather also had a delightful story about his grandmother's family getting confused as to why everyone was in mourning dress. They were told that a tailor had died, and they were just confused. Why was everyone in mourning for a simple tailor? They didn't realize that Taylor was U.S. President Zachary Taylor, who died on 5 July 1850. The two immigration stories, Buffalo versus Boston, aren't really conflicting, but they're also not co particularly complementary either. Any trip west from Boston at the time involved either a 450-mile two-week walk over the Berkshire Mountains and across western New York to Buffalo. That city is much more easily reached via a two- or three-day ferry trip up the St. Lawrence from the port of Quebec City. It just doesn't feel like the two are likely to be combined. Thing is, there's no evidence to support either story. There are absolutely no records of Joseph Fitzgerald arriving in Boston, and there should be. The Steerage Act of 1819 required every passenger ship landing in any U.S. port to provide a list of passengers detailing name, age, and occupation, and Boston's records are complete. There are also no records of either the Fitzgeralds or Burks arriving in Canada, but then there really shouldn't be. Why should it matter to the British Empire if residents moved internally? Ireland to Canada was little different than Cornwall to Coventry. For years, I was attracted to the Boston story because of the massive details my grandfather related. Buffalo, though? The mention was so brief, honestly, I forgot all about it until quite recently. Here's the thing. Charles Klein's story mentioning Buffalo was published in a short biography in a 1908 book entitled A History of Kane County, Illinois. That means he related those facts in 1906 or 1907, while his grandmother, Ellen Burke, was still alive, and just a couple of years after his grandfather, Joseph Fitzgerald, had died. Charles probably heard everything firsthand, and was relating it while the memories were fresh. In comparison, my grandfather was 27 years younger than his cousin, Charles Klein, and just a toddler when Charles' story of Buffalo was published. Moreover, my grandfather was just 14 when Ellen Burke died several years after her first stroke. He also wrote down their story more than half a century later in the 1970s, and there's no way to tell what he remembers from his grandmother and what he heard secondhand from his father in the 1920s. That huge gap in time between when the stories were written down combined with the older story being heard firsthand makes Charles' story about Buffalo much more probable. It also makes me wonder if my grandfather heard about Buffalo, but over the years began to doubt his memory. I mean, both start with B, but Boston was a major port of entry for the Irish for decades. We rarely think about Quebec City being a major port of entry, but in some years during the famine, more Irish came in via Quebec City than via New York and Boston combined. 
And Buffalo happens to share something with Manitowoc, Wisconsin, where Ellen Burke and Joseph Fitzgerald married in 1855. They are both on the shores of the Great Lakes. In the 1850s, a seven-day ferry from Quebec City to Chicago, passing Buffalo and Manitowoc along the way, cost just 35 cents. That's about $12 in today's money. If you believe inflation calculators on the web can go back that far, I'm not so sure, but still, this was not an expensive trip. Quebec City was a major port of arrival for Irish immigrants, as fares to Canada were substantially cheaper than to U.S. ports. Now, I've got no firm evidence either way, but I think those hints point to my second great-grandparents' immigration story from County Clare, Ireland to Wisconsin. They arrived in Canada and moved west along the Great Lakes. I hope you enjoyed this five-minute genealogy video. If you have any questions or suggestions for future video topics, please leave them in the comments. If you like my channel, please subscribe and give a thumbs up.